Hello everybody, uh, my name is Robert Dimbleby. I'm Publishing Manager at Ho River Publishing and on behalf of my team and our authors and presenters I'd like to welcome you to our live webinar and book launch. Um, first of all, greetings to our presenters. Um, Dr. Kyrie Cove is Principal Research Fellow and Associate Professor at the Australian Institute for Suicide Research and Prevention and Co-Director of the WHO Collaborating Centre for Research and Training in Suicide Prevention at Griffiths University in Queensland, Australia. She's been working in suicide research and prevention since 1998 and has published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers and most recently has acted as lead editor of a book that we've just published entitled Advancing Suicide Research. Um, I'd also like to give an equally warm welcome to Professor Nav Kapoor, um, Professor of Psychiatry and Population Health and Head of Research at the Centre for Mental Health and Safety at the University of Manchester in the UK, um, as well as having published more than 300 pair peer-reviewed research papers and a 2019 book on suicide prevention. Nav is also the recipient of the 2021 American Association of Suicidology Louis I. Dublin Lifetime Achievement Award for Suicide Prevention. Last but not least, a very warm welcome to all of our guests. Um, before we move on to Kyrie's talk on common mistakes and problems in suicide research and how to avoid them, a couple of household housekeeping matters. Um, as you've all seen, we're using Microsoft Teams live event technology for this webinar. That means that all guests are on mute, so you can't actually speak with us. However, if you do have a question or wish to make a comment, which we're very happy to sit here, um, please use the Q&A function. You should, you should be able to see that on your screen. Um, it works like a normal chat. Um, we'll be monitoring it. If there's a technical question, um, the whole grade team will answer it. If it's a question to a presenter, uh, my colleague Lisa Bennett uh, will relay it verbally so that the presenter can respond. Um, just bear in mind that life event often has a sort of transmission delay of up to half a minute or a minute, so responses may take a little while. Um, the whole event is being recorded and will be available to view and share shortly after the meeting at hografer.com slash US or for folks in Europe at hografer.com slash EU. Um, we'll also be distributing, it, distributing information about the um, video about the recording through our social media channels, our YouTube channels and in our newsletter. And finally, at the end of the event, um, we'll be giving you some details about how you can get a copy of Advancing Suicide Research with a 20% discount. So thank you, that's enough from me. Um, it's now time to move on to the main event. So um, Kyrie Colvers will now take the stage and talk to you about common mistakes and problems in suicide research and how to avoid them. Thank you. Kyrie, we can't hear you. Can you unmute, please? Sorry, you're going to have to start again. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us uh, here today, wherever across the world uh, you are. And um, I'm very sorry that considering the circumstances that we can't uh, meet in person, but hopefully uh, that will come uh, later this year. And uh, I would like uh, to very much thank uh, Hogref for this uh, fantastic opportunity to do this live event uh, today. And uh, I think I will now move to my presentation. And uh, start sharing the slides with you. I hope you can see them. So 
So uh, firstly, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, people with lived experience um, of suicide and also make a note uh, that uh, some of the content might be a little bit uh, sensitive uh, to some people. And uh, my main focus of today's first presentation is um, to talk about uh, common mistakes and uh, misconceptions in, uh, in suicide research. And uh, here, of course, uh, there are quite some of them, and I will cover really um, the ones which uh, Kairi, can I just can I just interrupt a minute? Sorry, uh, we can't see your slides. You maybe need to click the button again, please. Share your desktop. Here it's coming now. It'll be with us in a minute. There, we can see everything now, Kerry. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, my apologies. Some technical problems or misunderstandings why I couldn't share them. Um, so, uh, as mentioned, uh, they will be um, really uh, my perception of um, what what are really common mistakes and uh, not just mistakes necessarily but also misconceptions and considering relatively limited time i of course can't uh, cover all of them so uh, here are just some um, topics what i will be um touch up and throughout my presentation so i will be really um talking uh, briefly about them um, epidemiology, but also incidence and prevalence and mortality, some specific uh, um, terminologies um, in epidemiology differences or how to differentiate between case series and cohort studies. Uh, how about using controls in case control studies? Uh, what about qualitative studies and mixed methods research? So, Firstly, in suicide research, our central aim is to prevent su suicidal behaviors. And uh, it is relatively logical to take public health approach, uh, which really aims to uh, prevent uh, ill health and uh, death and also promote um, health. So Considering epidemiology is one of the public health tools which can be used in different ways, uh, there is a common misconception that epidemiology is just mainly about numbers, presenting numbers. This is actually not quite the case considering uh, epidemiology can be used in different ways. And uh, a few points here, for example, identifying them etiology and uh, uh, more specifically, with the aim to identify um, causation of uh, specific conditions and also linking that um, with relevant risk factors. Then uh, epidemiology is also focusing then more specifically on determining natural history of disease. Now, epidemiology clearly is used um, for describing health status of populations. And this is possibly one of the reasons why uh, there is common misconception that it is mainly about numbers. And especially at the moment, for example, this year throughout the um, unfortunate uh, and last year um, COVID-19 pandemic, we often hear a lot of numbers and uh, it may further um, promote the understanding that epidemiology is just a lot of numbers. Uh, at the same time, it's also, of course, considers evaluation of different interventions, but also developing the interventions. So the effectiveness and efficiency of health services, promotion and prevention activities, 
are really part of epidemiology as well. So in wider terms, um, it should build foundation of public policy so we could more widely uh, pre prevent different types of conditions or diseases and focus on health promotion. Now, from here, obviously, it makes more sense um, the public health model, considering uh, epidemiology really drives actions within public health. And uh, here it makes quite much more sense when we are, for example, taking a figure from the WHO first suicide report, where we start with surveillance, which is part of epidemiology, to identify the problem and um, suicidal behavior um, of and its magnitude. From there, we can further move to identify risk and protective factors from which will be helpful to develop interventions and evaluate them, which further could be inter, uh, implemented and scaled up. So now uh, moving to a specific uh, kind of crucial terms when it comes to the epidemiology, but they are very central also to suicide research. And here, when we are talking, these, these terms keep mixed up quite a bit, despite they seem to be very distinguishable. Um, there is still comes up that they are mixed up in papers. So often we, are we can compare uh, really um, prevalence with the path. So this is a prevalence. This is how many people at a specific time point have a specific condition. So now when we are talking about incidents, this is like coming out of the path to the top and uh, these are really specifically new cases um, of the condition or a disease. So now if it rehappen now when it comes to the different conditions it can be different here it can be recurrence for example but if the cases are leaving from the path that is considered as mortality or it can be compared to the mortality at the same time with some of the conditions especially with health conditions they can be also recovery so um, they are leaving really the path and remaining alive. And uh, with some of the conditions, um, it's quite easy to understand. But with in, uh, now let's look at it from the suicide uh, behaviors perspective. Then uh, incidents should be first suicide attempt or first suicide attempt during our study period can be also um, considered in some cases as incidents. So recurrence would be repeated suicide attempt. Prevalence are all people who have attempted suicide in such either it is lifetime or we are considering the pool of bath as, uh, for example, a specific last year. And now suicide is mortality. What, um, what I have noticed quite a bit is uh, that people often use word incidents for suicide. This is actually not quite correct, uh, at least not in epidemiology. And, uh, and uh, for example, with, with suicide, and especially when it comes to mortality, then Yes, true. You can uh, one dies only once, so you can consider as incidents. But really, in epidemiology, uh, incidents is more referring uh, to morbidity and not to the mortality. But I agree that in some it can be different. Maybe, for example, in criminology, where incidents um, could be determined in a different way more widely. Now, there are multiple different um, study designs developed uh, in epidemiology, which are useful for um, different 
purposes, and we have to be always careful uh, to identify first what uh, is our aim and with the, which one is really the best uh, study design for your aim. Here, um, I won't have time to go through all the specific um, um, study designs. However, I have noticed that um, they are quite frequent that case series and cohort studies may be mixed up. So let me explain it a little bit further. So firstly, when we are considering uh, epidemiology, an important term is outcome. Let's say it's it's a specific disease condition or it could be that. And now we have uh, exposure, which could be, uh, which is a, can be a potential risk or protective factor. So, and traditionally, we would expect that um, the direction of investigation inquiry is really from the exposure to outcome. However, not all the epidemiological study designs um, don't run in uh, um, prospectively. There are also retrospective study designs which are looking backward. So, for example, here, that's the important difference between case series, for example, where we are retrospectively looking back, we identified, for example, um, a case of suicide or a number of them, maybe it was through a surveillance system, and now we are investigating what happened uh, to these people who died by suicide uh, before. And maybe we identified that certain amount of them had a mental health condition. So now when we are talking about cohort studies, the direction is opposite how we are uh, doing the inquiry. So now an important point here is still I have noticed quite some studies where um, people um, call um, studies over time uh, analyzing, for example, suicide cases, uh, cohort studies. Actually, they are not cohort studies. They are case series. But yes, if we are studying a group of people with mental health conditions and we are following them up and finding out whether they died by suicide, then this is a cohort study. So now in some cases, uh, Cohort study can actually start with an outcome, which could be a suicide attempt. So here, our um, we can uh, and outcome could be a repeated suicide attempt, or it could be also um, suicide. In that case, um, they are also cohort studies, but um, they are called um, survival studies. Uh, mainly, or but they it they can be called also just as cohort studies. So at the same time, of course, there is a possibility if we are investigating a group of people who have attempted suicide, and we are investigating them and asking from them about their previous suicide attempt, then this is a case series. This is when we don't end up following them up. And uh, this is a very important uh, to keep in mind when um, designing and considering uh, what study type are you really um, using at the moment. So now um, another complex question, and it's particularly complex question in uh, suicide research, is choosing controls for the case control study. Here on this figure at the moment, what you can see is really actually a case series. And but case series can be extended into a um, case control study. So ideally our cases are coming from the fine population, of course. And now we are choosing 
also we should choose our controls from a defined population. And if our cases are people who died by suicide, then our controls should be the ones who didn't die by suicide. So, and there are a few options here, or two main options. Of course, one is to use living controls, which is uh, quite logical. So you can identify what are the uh, risk factors to die by suicide. At the same time, when we are specifically studying suicides, there is a further obstacle there because if we are analyzing or investigating people who died by suicide, we have to consider that the information is coming uh, from their relatives. And the relatives have gone through um, or going through a bereavement uh, process, which of course may contribute to the different emotional reactions, but also uh, to recall bias. When we are using living controls, living controls, even if we are using their relatives for information sources, they haven't gone through a similar uh, process and their knowledge and recall bias is much less a degree. At the same time, when we now consider that maybe we should try uh, and investigate, compare them to other types of deaths, where also um, relatives have gone through um, um, rather um, complicated bereavement, um, and uh, may have more similarities when it comes to the recall bias. We need to consider that um, there might be a number of risk factors are uh, similar here, why they also um, died. So it could be that they have also more physical health conditions. They may have also more aggressive uh, behaviors or impulsivity if they are have died maybe for accidental deaths. So here it is really hard to say uh, what approach is the correct one. Sometimes it's recommended um, to use different controls in the one study, but of course we all know that it's um, it's rather expensive and um, time, time consuming. So now um, I spoke at the moment mainly of course, from the epidemiological approach and quantitative studies. Um, qualitative research, um, despite epidemiology saying, yes, we can do qualitative research as well, but it's more of a supportive tool when it comes to the epidemiology. However, in suicide research, um, it is definitely important to also um, go more uh, into depth with qualitative research. And uh, here at the same time, um, considering uh, qualitative research has been, um, as Heidi Helmeland has highlighted quite a lot in uh, her writings about like there isn't enough or majority is really a quantitative, but we need to explore more further deeper people's perceptions, experiences. So, but now here there is common misconception that I'm, uh, I'm interviewing some people and then I'm just going to do call it thematic analysis and uh, that's all. At the same time, we need to keep in mind that um, there are many different options. And by some researchers, there are more than 30 different types of uh, um, qualitative research um, methods. So um, by one of the biggest gurus in qualitative research, uh, Creswell, um, he has identified that um, there are five really main and most commonly used uh, methods. And uh, the, from the beginning, we need to identify what is really our aim and what is our intention. 
So from there already starts looking what is really suitable thematic analysis, uh, sorry, qualitative um, research approach, but I should use because from that depends also to a certain degree your um, your uh, sample sizing, but also your further analysis. So from here, we can move further to uh, mixed methods research. So yes, we, especially um, in the olden days, there is um, two approaches. Which one is the best and which one gives us more? And uh, luckily in uh, these days, there is much and much more movement towards uh, uh, using mixed methods approach. And now here, similarly um, to qualitative analysis, there are different approaches how to do that. So it is not just that I'm doing some qualitative and some quantitative study and uh, then merge them together and see what happens. There are um, those here, uh, again, uh, um, the most um, common uh, uh, designs. There are definitely more designs than that. And uh, um, yeah, so this is this is the main uh, the main options. So now, uh, especially from the last slide, um, the study design mentioning embedded design is gives us further indication that uh, also a psychological autopsy study can be both. It can be qualitative and quantitative. This is again a big um, debate um, across the um, in, in suicide research whether psychological autopsy has the roots in qualitative or quantitative research, uh, uh, approach. And actually, uh, it is both. There is, of course, Edwin Schneidman's approach who coined really the term psychological autopsy. Um, he, um, his approach was more qualitative. At the same time, approximately, um, there were Ameri other American researchers who were doing more using more quantitative approach and uh, interviewing also relatives. While often those uh, schools kind of and research has been to a certain degree mixed together and, um, and uh, at the same time also the first uh, people using quantitative uh, um, psychological autopsy studies, um, they ended up uh, uh, considering it as um, um, they ended up considering it as uh, a clinical psychological autopsy study. So, and uh, here I do hope you did find something useful uh, from this um, presentation. And as I said, I'm unable to cover. Um, all the different topics or the topics what you may have thought that would be definitely important ones. But anyway, feel free um, to ask questions. Kyrie, thanks. Kyrie, thanks so much for that fascinating and informative talk. Um, I guess there's quite a few takeaways for us there for us to go away and digest from your uh, bathtub analogies in uh, epidemiology to use of mixed quantitative and qualitative approaches. Um, uh, I've not seen any questions yet, but um, I'm sure Lisa will jump in if there are. Um, I suspect that the substance of the talk hints at some of your motivations for putting together the book that you, along with Marika Cizak, Peter and Ari Vianic, and my old friend and collaborator Diego De Leo, just published with us. 
Um, if memory serves, you and Diego first approached me with the idea of putting together a really substantive book on research methods in suicidology at the Congress of the International Association for Suicide Prevention back in 2017. Well, three and a half years later, and uh, after a lot of work and effort on the part of editors, contributors and the team at Ho River, I was really thrilled just before the holiday season to get my hands on the first advanced copy of the book, um, which was really great. That was a really nice way to go into Christmas break. Um, perhaps you could now tell everybody a little, book, a little bit about how the book came about, about your motivation and aims in, in publishing it and what contribution you think it can make. Um, could I just um, interrupt with a question, please? Um, we have a question from Anonymous. Um, what is the best method to choose controls? <laughs> well, that is a good question. Uh, it depends uh, what are you trying to uh, achieve, like what, what are your hypotheses in first place? Like, uh, for example, if, uh, if you are studying like um, all the adults and you're choosing a control group, then uh, if you're choosing a control group of other deaths, then, uh, for example, despite we know that physical conditions may be a risk factor of uh, suicide, it doesn't come up because for example, people who die by natural uh, causes or even by accidental causes, they may have much higher uh, prevalence of, uh, of physical conditions. So you would not find it as a, as a risk factor. At the same time, if you compare them to the living controls, you're very likely to find that it is a risk factor. So there is there is no clear uh, indication. It's kind of one of the hard questions uh, which is which is discussed like uh, for example recently uh, a year ago there was uh, a paper by Jane Perkins and David Connell who tried to uh, um, argument a little bit around the topic which one could be the best at the same time considering I have been involved in uh, different psychological autopsy studies and uh, in Estonia uh, we used living controls at the same time in Australia we used um, southern darts and uh, uh, you can see their um, differences and and of course, you have to just consider also the um, conditions of also who is giving you that information. It's it's not an easy um, easy question, and there is no easy answer um, to this because it's it's really challenging. Thanks, Carrie. Thank yeah. You. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how the book came about now, perhaps? Sure. I will try to share my slides again. Okay. So, um, our book, um, <laughs> it by my colleagues already called as called a book as, um, um, the plan with the cover was um, to use um, um, suicide prevention colors as um, yellow and uh, orange. So uh, to a certain degree, you can see them on our cover. And um, of course, firstly, I would like to uh, um, acknowledge uh, my great co-editors, Merike, Peter, Airi and Diego. And as you as you already said, it was quite a long process. And uh, if you were talking about three and a half years when um, 
uh, Diego spoke to you about our idea, then uh, the idea actually came already uh, even a few years before that. As uh, considering uh, I'm a course convener um, of um, sociology um, postgraduate and master courses at the Australian Institute for Suicide Research and Prevention at Griffith University. And uh, I was involved in uh, uh, lecturing. Our courses are online and I was lecturing um, already over quite long time now over 10 years and uh, what I saw from the student assignments was um, there were problems we, we did ask them to read uh, uh, different papers and majority of the papers they are um, linked to public health epidemiology and uh, People just don't have that knowledge and uh, even even people who have studied psychology, um, they may not necessarily understand all those concepts because there are differences between um, different fields and uh, and I was like, well, there isn't actually really anything, any helpful. Um, material for them because and also if we consider suicide research it doesn't fully fall under epidemiology either it's it uses quite some epidemiological concepts but it at the same time there is a psychology there are social sciences psychiatry a religion all the different field and people from the different field which is important it to be uh, multidisciplinary uh, and suicide as a phenomenon is multidisciplinary so um, from there um, I, I first said to Diego like uh, what you reckon uh, I was just at airport reading student works like what about this type of uh, um, a book? So literally kind of a uh, wants the book for everyone who wants to get uh, an overview of the research approaches and issues concerning suicide. And um, of course, we didn't want to limit it purely in, in epidemiology, but we still wanted to them to have different options there. And um, so, so that's exactly the plan was to provide a comprehensive toolbox of what are really currently the best practices in suicide research in order to do high quality research um, using um, quantitative, qualitative and mixed methods from a public perspective. Of course, um, there are other approaches and uh, we, we do not touch and we didn't plan we immediately limited um, to go into genetic studies or some other approaches um, as it would have become too wide uh, in our view and uh, and also at the same time we wanted to give some sort of a cons con um, um, background as well so like um, that people at the same time can also have some background like um, what are the definition of issues what what is the background his in from historical perspective and um, what are the ethical aspects uh, we need to consider and also what is that wider public health um, approach so um, and then one of uh, one of my other mentors from uh, ESRAP, Professor John O'Gorman, uh, gave me a real hint and said, like, just just go ahead, do it. And and of course, I was keen to um, find um, some good collaborations and the really collaborations closest to my heart was the current Institute ESRAP and the place 
uh, where I worked before, Estonian Swedish Mental Health and Suicidology Institute. So, and um, here are some photos throughout travels and uh, our meetings and uh, process, how it um, happened um, through different travels, through different conferences. And uh, in one photo, you can see uh, me in Estonia Nordic um, suicide research um, <laughs> during the cold, cold winter, but actually there was some um, electricity was out. So that's why we are in close. So um, yeah, it's um, very, very grateful for um, for their support and our discussions, how uh, and what should we cover and uh, yeah, how to make it all uh, come together. And uh, and of course, it's it's not only us, it's a magnificent uh, authors of different um, chapters. And um, unfortunately, throughout the writing the book, um, a beautiful colleague, a beautiful soul, um, associate professor Alison Milner uh, had a very sad accident and uh, therefore our book is dedicated uh, to Alison. Um, she was an amazing uh, researcher and uh, uh, one of a kind. I met Alison um, 13 years ago when I started uh, working at uh, ESREP as we worked on the same project and uh, she was still doing her PhD and I was amazed how determined she was and uh, what the goals she did set and the most amazing in the in the beginning when she said that she's doing uh, um, thesis on globalization and suicide I was like right okay good luck and she just did it and she just did it much faster sometimes when i'm uh, in research gate as allison uh, left days rap and uh, went further to melbourne uni but at the same time at the moment even in uh, in um, research gate sometimes i just have this feeling that she's just in melbourne because there are still so many papers from her uh, coming out. So now about the book more specifically. So very grateful for uh, Professor Kill Saltzman writing us uh, a great forward. And then the first block of um, of the uh, of the book is really covering uh, Firstly, starting with what is what is the history and how it underpins um, the frameworks um, of modern suicide research by Guru in the in the field, Professor Morton Silverman. Then uh, definitions in suicide research by uh, um, colleague Benjamin, who um, um, who is writing more about the definitional aspects, but also about uh, what are the terminologies, what are recommended, and what are the terminology we should uh, avoid for uh, not stigmatizing people with lived experience. Then uh, giving a public health approach to suicide research, uh, of course, the best person uh, to write about it is Professor Paul Yip, uh, together with her colleague Lin Dang. And the uh, ethical aspects of suicide research definitely very important. How, how, and uh, but also how we, um, what we need to consider uh, to be sensitive. What we need to consider. Uh, when we are going through and doing our suicide research. And here uh, a group of, it was just a coincidentally um, a group from re of researchers from uh, Melbourne Uni led by Carl Andreessen uh, was just doing a study around it. So now uh, the next um, 
section uh, is focusing on different types of uh, um, epidemiological aspects. So here, uh, talking about measures in suicide research, um, also like uh, what aspects to look there, um, how to present it, how to interpret it uh, by P Peter and also Ella Arensman. Um, further um, observation of studies in suicide research by myself, Merike, and the uh, Emeritus Professor Ian Rocket, who is a guru in uh, epidemiology. Further intervention studies where uh, Professor Ulrich Heger with his experience joined us. Uh, data linkage, definitely um, very, very important um, and enabling uh, to do large scale studies. What, what is really behind it and how to do it? Uh, of course, the best ones in the world uh, in, uh, in suicide research, our Scandinavian colleagues, Annette Ping and uh, Eleanor. Kairi, uh, can I just interrupt? Um, I don't know whether you're aware of the time, but it's uh, quarter two now. And um, uh, I think maybe some people have, have only got so much time. So yeah. um, it's great that you're going through the book. Um, yeah. So people have got an idea now. So maybe we could pass on to Nav. Yes, sounds good. Um, I'm very sorry for... Um, running slightly um, over time. However, I really wanted to acknowledge um, all the different uh, contributors of the book. So that was kind of the uh, main reason uh, why I was, um, because I just have two more slides um, to present after that. And uh, yeah, so next, just a very quick slide, which I just can't miss, is um, dedication to my um, research assistant, uh, who is doing also uh, book editing uh, with me throughout um, the COVID days. And uh, yeah, for the very end, I would really like you to thank very much to uh, all my co-editors, uh, all authors of different chapters, my colleagues from ASREP, Griffith University, our publisher, and of course, our different families. So thank you very much. And I'm very sorry that I have run over time. Thanks, Kairi. Um, now I'd like to introduce Nav Kapoor, uh, who's um, um, going to tell us what he thought about the book. Thank you. Nav, I think you need you'll to. See, you'll see I was testing you. Uh, some people say that I'm better uh, when I'm on mute. Uh, hello to you, wherever in the world you might be. Uh, greetings from a grey and rainy Manchester that you can uh, see behind me. Uh, hope you're all well anyway. Um, uh, thanks to Robert and colleagues for hosting this event. Thanks for Kyrie and amazing co-editors and all her co-authors uh, for producing a, a, an amazing book. Um, I've, I've been working in suicide research for about 25 years, and um, it's a privilege because it's an area where you can make a difference, make a real world um, difference. Um, but it's also a really challenging area of research, not least because it's an intensely kind of individual or personal phenomenon suicide, uh, but it's a phenomenon that occurs in a wider uh, societal context. Uh, and what that means, what that means is uh, that you need multidisciplinary researchers uh, using a wide variety of different research methods. And that's where Kyrie and colleagues book comes in because it covers, uh, you've heard about epidemiology and health services research, which I use in my day to day work, uh, but also, you know, the chapters that are sometimes neglected in in other books. So uh, lots on qualitative suicide research, health economics um, and even um, some works from Jane and others, Jane Perkins and others, thinking about how we evaluate suicide prevention at scale. So some really innovative uh, work in this book. 
um, as well as a discussion uh, of the all important ethical issues. Ethical issues uh, should be at the forefront uh, of our minds as suicide researchers. Um, so I think um, those of us who have uh, been at this a while, uh, those of us who are kind of uh, old timers in suicide research, uh, will learn a lot from this book. Uh, but I think it's going to be invaluable, really, really helpful uh, for people who are in the uh, first half uh, rather than the second half uh, of their uh, careers. Um, so, as I said in the book, um, I really just wish uh, there'd been something like it uh, when I was started out. So uh, thanks to everyone. Thanks to all of you for attending. I'll hand back to Rob. Um, thanks, Nav. I'm sure Kyrie and her co-editors and all the contributors are going to be really delighted and honoured that their uh, work has earned that sort of high praise for an eminent figure such as yourself. I mean, certainly my team and I are, are all delighted. So um, now at a, a traditional book launch, of course, there'd be drinks and nibbles and people would be able to mingle and chat and flip through printed copies of the book. They'd be able to buy it and get it signed by the editors. Or their favourite contributors. I'm afraid web-based technologies have not yet found a way of beaming champagne and canapes over at all to us, though maybe 3D printers will get somewhere in that direction at some point. But what you can do if you're interested in browsing the book, um, which is out in print or as an e-book, is check out the uh, free sample pages on our website. Um, you can also purchase it there with a 20% discount. Um, um, simply go to holgrafer.com slash US or holgrafer.com slash EU and enter the discount code um, webinar SR21, um, webinar suicide research 21. Um, it's valid for print and ebook editions until 15th of February. Um, after that brief plug for the book, um, I'd also like to remind everybody that the webinar is going to be recorded or has been recorded and, and it's going to be available for viewing afterwards or you can share it with friends or colleagues who might be interested. Um, um, it'll be, we're going to be posting uh, information on it on our social media channels, on our website and on our newsletter. So um, thanks to everybody. Um, I'd like to finish off this talk uh, or this event with Basically, thanks to everybody, to Kyrie for an informative talk, um, to editors and authors and contributors to, uh, to this wonderful book, um, uh, to the team at Hograver who, who A, got the book out and B, made this event possible. And finally, of course, to everybody who took part. Um, thank you for being with us for the past 45, 55 minutes and uh, giving us some of your valuable time. Um, I've learned a lot of things today and I hope you all have too. Once again, thank you everybody and have a good day.